we're gonna get started. Um, so we just uh, finished Parashat Behar. We read um, um, we read this Torah portion um, very interestingly that starts from Behar Sinai, from uh, what we learned from Mount Sinai. Um, it was very interesting to hear that uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, the Rav was uh, feeling well. On Shabbat, he gave a long shiur in uh, Kfar Chabad. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend, um, but it was very nice to hear. Um, in this week, I'm going to try to go over a couple of subjects in the uh, wonders of the week. Um, and um, let me just see if you, no, just can't wait. Um, and we'll try to cover them. Um, in as, as broad of a way as possible in a condensed uh, amount of time and, uh, and way. Um, so we'll start with uh, a small note in this week's wonders about Mount Sinai. Um, recently, and uh, we will say Blee there that uh, we've had a minhag to say something from the Noam Elimelech from Lizhensk um, every, uh, every week. So we'll just say a small beginning that he says is that um, the famous Mishnah in the beginning of Pirkei Avot um, that says that uh, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, that Moses um, accepted or got the Torah from Mount Sinai, um, uh, reflects the idea that Mount Sinai was the lowest mountain out of the competing mountains that wanted to um, have the Torah be given on them. And it, uh, it was chosen because Hashem um, wanted to show the symbol of being humble, of, of anava, um, of modesty. And uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, even though he was the greatest prophet of all time, and maybe the greatest person of all time, except uh, um, uh, Adam, um, the first person, and Mashiach, the last big person. So those those three, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was the in the middle. In, the, in a sense, he was the um, most uh, the greatest person in the world. He was still very very. The, even the Torah itself writes on him that he was uh, very modest, and that um, that acceptance allowed him to accept the Torah and to give it over. Um, but there's something else that we learned from the fact that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. And this also um, has to do with, right after that, speaking about Shemitah, um, the sabbatical year of the land, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, and uh, the connection is that um, Mount Sinai is in the desert. And desert is the expression of, of to, to in the simple uh, translation of desolate, but uh, we'll translate it as very strong force. Now the, the force of tohu um, is something that usually breaks things. That if someone is very, uh, very strong about something or something is very, very strong, many, many times it causes, uh, it causes destruction. As we spoke about uh, the biggest energy, the biggest energy force that we have is uh, is the eight thumb, and and that is used. Um, it could either be used for great energy or for a big bomb. So um, the force um, of tohu of the desert um, was where the Torah was given, but it was meant to be given, meaning after it was given in the desert, it was meant to be placed in the land of Israel, which is supposed to be um, a place with large abilities to accept large vessels, as we call it. Um, and these things we have to bring in to, to Eretz Israel, meaning every force that we accept from Mount Sinai, from the Torah, everything we learn, we need to bring in this, into this world in a way of tikkun, in a way that, um, that, ex that is accepted and, um, and adds things instead of breaking things. We know in general that ideology is used in the world to break things. 
And that's not what we want to do. What the Torah wants to do um, is to create something that, that, that generates um, fruits in the world and not desolate and emptiness. Um, so the first part of this week, uh, we'll say that we're um, every week gathering to, uh, and we also, uh, Elazar um, helps us put it on YouTube. Uh, we're learning together the week's wonders uh, for very strong health to our Rav, Rav Yitzchak Feibich ben Breina Malka, to our friend Bluma Badgin and Del Tova, and my son Levia Via ben Ayala, amongst all the uh, people that need uh, health, all the Cholim in Klal Yisrael. So um, the first part of the wonder speaks about the inner um, depth and the inner explanation of, of the sabbatical year of Shemitah. Um, the, the Pasuk says, Shesh shanim tizra that uh, you should plant your field for six years. Um, that on the seventh year, you should let it go and, and abandon your land. And, and the, the simplest question that we want to ask is why? What's the idea behind the sabbatical year? Um, so first of all, we want to we want to um, um, we want to look at these uh, explanations that we're going to say in the uh, and, and the mitzvah of of shemitah. We want to look at it on three levels. There are three levels from the book of Sefer Yetzira, um, which is a famous Kabbalah book uh, that was uh, written by uh, Abraham uh, himself, the first Jew. Um, and it says that there are three levels to the world. There's olam, the world itself, which usually is referred to as space. Shana, which is year, but usually refers to as time. And then nefesh. Nefesh is, is our soul and uh, people. So there are three things in the world, three bases to the world. Space, time, and soul, and, and humans, and people. Um, now, we can see that this mitzvah of Shemitah has these three things. First of all, it's a very specific mitzvah. It's only for the land of Israel um, in a specific place in the field. Secondly, it has to do with time. It's only on the seventh year. Um, and third, it has to do with the person, meaning uh, we know that if the land doesn't belong to the Jew, then it doesn't necessarily have the kedusha, uh, the holiness, but on the other hand, the obligation of Shemitah. So it has to have the three things, space in Eretz Israel, time, and, um, and belonging to a Jew, to a person, to a neshama. Um, so, so why, what is the reason? So the first reason that, um, that uh, Rambam gives uh, actually is that the land is supposed to, um, is supposed to be rejuvenated, meaning that every every seventh year you're supposed to leave the land in order so that the land becomes stronger for the next six years. Um, now this is this is a hard um, a hard thing to to say. There's lots of questions about it. The, the simplest question is why is that a mitzvah? If it's a practical thing, if it's a technical thing in the world, then there's no need for a mitzvah. It's, it would just happen. If, you, if someone, God forbid, does not observe Shemitah, then right away the land would not give fruits. Why do we need to say that if you don't observe Shemitah, the land is going to be very upset? The Torah said that the land will throw you out if you don't observe Shemitah. There seems to be something much deeper than the simple sense of, uh, of uh, giving, giving, giving the land a break. Um, the second reason that we see also, um, there are different mefarshim, but the simplest reason is, is for the poor people. We know that when you leave the land, you're supposed to leave it for everyone. And who enjoys that? The poor people, people that don't have land, that don't have the ability to, um, to grow crop, they would be able to go to, to the fields and collect. But again, this also, this reason also feels like something that's not complete because you can always tell someone, give more donation. Um, the simple mitzvah allows the person to go into his land and collect uh, some fruit for himself. You just can't make it a business. You can't, um, 
he can collect in order to sell. So if that's the case, if you want to take out the profits from the, uh, from the people that own the land, then there are easier ways to do that. <laughs> um, so that's the, the second reason, which again, has a harder, harder time for us to understand. The third reason is for ourselves. And this reason also compares to, to the sabbatical day of the year. It's very interesting that the world in the old days and some places, very few places still today, um, has been working seven days a week, 365 days a year. People did not have time to think. Where do we see that? We see that by Pharaoh. Pharaoh said that when the, when the people are working, they don't have time to think about redemption. And the fact that they're thinking there's this guy, Moses, that comes over and says, we want to go out, that's because they're not busy enough. So having um, nonstop work helps the dictator uh, control the people. People can't think when they don't have a break. So if that's the case, then we want to have, just like we have a break in a, in a person's life, every six days we take a sabbatical day, the sh famous Shabbat, um, which again, Jews very much hold by one day. You know, some places in the world already think of two or three days. It doesn't work like that. The opposite, as we spoke, I think last week was in uh, the wonders that uh, there are six days of working and those six days need to be six days of work. We don't believe in, uh, in just sitting around and, and not, not working. We believe in working the same way that we believe in having a Shabbat, the seventh day off. Um, now, what does this help? What does taking a break help? Taking a break helps see the bigger picture. And what is the bigger picture? The bigger picture is that there is Hashem, there is God, and he looks over the world and he, um, and, and he cares about the world and he controls the world. And when we work in this world, we're working in God's world. And how do you see that? You see that when you stop controlling things, when there's one day where you leave the control to Hashem. And in this case, there's one year, there's a full year that you leave the land to Hashem. So let's think of these uh, three um, explanations that we say and, and that we said and try to look at the inner parts of them. The first part is like uh, uh, an ecological uh, type of answer that the land needs a break. Now, what does that refer to in our, in our nefesh? What do we want to learn from that? We want to learn from that the, the, the midah, the very special midah of Yira. Yira, which could be translated as fear or awe, but we, based on uh, Rav Ginsburg's uh, very deep explanation, translated as sensitivity, we are supposed to be sensitive. We as Jews and we as people are supposed to be sensitive to God's world. We're not supposed to go around breaking things. And if the land needs a break and you don't give it to her, to the land, then you're not being sensitive to the land. And within ourselves, we should look at what we do in the world and make sure that what we're doing is done in a sensitive way that doesn't break things. So that's the first thing that we learn from the year of Shemitah, from the sabbatical year, is that sometimes you need to, you need to, to take a break. And, and, and that break also needs to happen all the time, meaning just like there's one sabbatical year, one sabbatical day, and it's supposed to be within ourselves all the time. You're all the time supposed to look and see, am I using this thing ecologically? Again, we're, we're talking about land. We could talk about people. Uh, friends, we can talk about anything that you're doing in the world, you're supposed to do it in a sensitive way. And that is the first thing, the first basis reason uh, that we connect to Shemitah, to be sensitive. The second reason is um, more, uh, um, has to do with the, uh, if we look at the break, there's, a, there's an explanation that explains um, in, in, the, in the sages that the, the land is supposed to have a break every two years, meaning two years are supposed to work and the third year it's supposed to take a break. So two years work, third year break. And that's the best way um, that, that uh, the land would produce the most. And what does Hashem tell us? Tells us the opposite. Six years, you're supposed to work the land really hard. You're supposed to ignore 
the basic sense that they had back then, um, and some of it could be even looked at today, that the land is supposed to have a break. You're supposed to ignore that. Six years, you're supposed to ignore that. And not only that, what you will see is supposedly in the sixth year, it's supposed to be the worst year. After you've worked the, the land for six years straight, the crop of the sixth year is supposed to be not so great. The opposite, the crop of the sixth year would last you for three years, for the sixth year, for the seventh year, and for the eighth year, because the seventh year, you didn't plant as much. So you see God's hand really, really closely. Um, I have a friend, his name is Ariel Ben Chitrit. He lives in Yitzhar, um, and he has a, a, a vineyard, um, grapes for, he, he has wine um, that he has, and he keeps Shemitah the best way possible, without any sticks, without any loopholes. And, um, and he saw phenomenal success from that. What do we see from this? We see that Hashem wants us to see his hands, his um, uh, what's the best word to say it, his connection, let's call it, to the land and to us by the success of the six years of working, especially the sixth year. And we're supposed to really connect to that. And when we connect to that, then the seventh year is supposed to be easy to let go. If you really see Hashem's hand over you and you see how the six years you've had great success and you connect to it, then the seventh year is supposed to be the easiest. Okay, Hashem, if you don't want me to work the land, it's all yours. You're the one giving me the success. And again, we can see it the same in the Shabbos, that every seventh day, we as Jews and, um, and we connect to it, we, we need and want to try to connect to it. We leave everything to Hashem. Seventh day, we're not working, we're not doing anything productive. We say that all of our productivity, that we expect Hashem to bless our productivity. Birkat Hashem ashir, that's a famous pasuk that teaches us that only the blessing of Hashem is what makes us wealthy. We want Hashem to bless our food and our work and our six days of working and our six years of working the land. But when you see Hashem within that, and again, we spoke about sensitivity, and we'll speak about it more in the second part of this week's wonders. Um, when you see Hashem's hands in that, then you're able to let go. And the seventh day, you're happy to let go. You're really happy because you're connected. And if Hashem wants me to work, I'll work. If not, he'll take care of it. So what, what do we have? We have three things. We have um, the world, space. Shana, which is year, which is time, and, um, and nefesh, and the people. And what we see by it, the world, the space, we give it rest. We remember Hashem in the time, in the specific time, as we see the seventh year or the seventh day, that we remember Hashem. And that remembrance is supposed to help us throughout the six days or years of working. And finally, finally, the, the final reason is that we want to show our confidence in Hashem. That is our people, that us as people, our nefesh, our soul, what, what do we want to show? What do we want to implement? We want to implement confidence, bitachon, that we have complete confidence in Hashem. And that confidence is supposed to help us be very, very successful. So we have uh, sensitivity, ira, we have faith, and we have uh, confidence. Again, we, we spoke a lot about the difference between faith as believing in Hashem and confidence acting on that faith. Um, so that's, uh, that's the uh, first part of this week's wonders. Um, in general, this week was a bit short. Um, uh, I don't know why, for some reasons, um, it was a shorter um, wonder, but the second part was very interesting. It was very deep Kabbalah uh, reading that Tikkun um, Gal um, in 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 the Zohar. There's a, there's uh, many Tikkunim. So the thirty third Tikkunim, which is just like the world the word Gal, 
which is uh, Galena, and also it, it Lag as the 33rd day of the Omer. So the Tikkun 33 speaks about something um, uh, that has to do with, uh, with sensitivity and love. And Rav Ginsburg taught it last year, exactly a year ago, um, a couple of days off, by Lag Baomer. Um, now we will say that during that time, uh, we were all aware of the unfortunate tragedy that happened in Miron, where um, there was a, there was a, a a lot of people at the same place at the same time as we spoke about the place and time, and unfortunately, uh, forty five people were uh, passed away, were crushed to death. Unfortunately. Um, now, very interesting that the word, word geula, which is how Rav Ginsburg spoke about this, and this is before we knew, is numerically the number 45, mem hey, which is the, um, which has this uh, tragic relevance to the 45 people um, that passed away in Meiron. Um, but in this tikkun, he speaks about um, what's, what's higher. Um, is Ar Vashem, the left side, which is year ah, sensitivity, or in a simple sense, fear, or love. What, what is the basis of the relationship between us and Hashem and us and the world? Is the basis fear or is the basis love? And this is a really deep and relevant question. And th there's a lot to think about this question. Um, I will just say before we'll continue on this, that when I thought about it, I thought about the simple sense that if you would take 300 years ago, what did people speak about? And 300 years and back, people always spoke about the might, how much power a certain society, whether it's an empire or person or family, how much power did they have? And based on that power, is there a success, et cetera? So what controlled the people, what people always thrive to have is fear, is for everyone to fear them. Today, in today's world, we see it in all the music and all the, um, in, in general, in the democracies of the world, we see that the things are based on love. People want to see how much good is in things in people. Even we spoke about this, even terror organizations still go by uh, the fact that they're giving food to people and, and they promote love. Again, some of it has a lot of uh, bad things to it, but the basics of the world changed from fear to love. Now, when we speak about Yira and Ava, there are two types of mitzvot that we have, There's 613 mitzvot, and they get split into mitzvot aseh, commandments that we are supposed to do, versus mitzvot lot aseh, commandments that we're supposed to make sure we do not do. So the simple sense in Tanya, it explains, that the source of the things of the mitzvot that we're supposed to do is like, for example, put on tzitzit, is the source of it is love. We love Hashem and therefore we do mitzvot aseh, the mitzvot commandments of doing. And mitzvot lot aseh is fear. We have fear of, 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 of uh, losing Hashem's way is in the world. And therefore we don't do something bad, like we don't do any uh, theft of different types, there's people theft and regular theft, and we, we get away from bad things. That is the simplest sense. However, there's a very deep teachings of Rabbi Lil Miparich, and in general that we learn that even Yirah is a mitzvah. So having sensitivity or fear or awe of Hashem is a mitzvah to say. So the source of fear of awe is love. So everything comes from the higher level of both of these is a higher level of love. Um, what is the difference between um, uh, these two things? The difference is that the simple sense when I'm doing something for Hashem, the love is, 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 is seen, is, is, a, is something revealed that you can see the love that I have for Hashem. And when I'm trying to not do something bad, it's, it's concealed. Now, again, you can think about people and ways of life in general. There's a saying that you can either run towards something or away from something. And we spoke about it. That the common sense is when you run towards something, then the love is revealed. You're revealing 
that you want something. When you're running away from something, then it's, it, it's hard to say what you, you are about. I can say what you're not. And um, now what are we supposed to have? We're supposed to have faith. Faith in, in mitzvot what, what has two levels to it. The first faith is that you're doing the right thing. Even when you're running away from something, um, for example, when you're running away from, uh, let's give a simple example that everyone connects to, when you're running away from stealing, there's something that, um, you know, uh, you, you make sure that you don't walk by a store that doesn't have anyone watching. You're running away, you, you're, you're putting borders between yourself and, and bad inclinations. What, why is that? So there's two senses. The first sense is that that's what God wants. Connecting to God in the simplest way that this is his commandments and I'm following, following orders. But the inner sense of it is that not only that, as, as we spoke before, there's supposed to be a tikkun. That when I'm not doing these things, I'm supposed to create a bigger vessel that allows for good things to happen, both in, in, in me personally, inside me, and outside in the world. So, um, what's the, uh, the, the word is emet. Emet is uh, emuna, mitzvah, and what's the third one? One second. And tikkun, I think that's it. One second. So, okay. So now what is difference? We spoke about today's world, that things change. What changed in today's world? What changed is that people do tshuva from love. Normally, well, why would someone do tshuva? Why would someone get close to Hashem? Because he doesn't want to end up in, 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 in Gehenna, in a bad place. Both in this world, the next world. But that's not, that's not why we see. We see many, many people today do tshuva because they want something better. They want to do good for themselves, for their friends, for the world. They want to do good and they find the way of Hashem to be a good thing. So their tshuva is something extraordinary, something uh, not normal, more like a Mashiach. Mashiach is something that's not normal. Um, Now, another thing that the Zohar, this is all just touching the, uh, the teachings of the Zohar that Rav Ginsburg gave, uh, and lots of complicated Zohar things that everyone can look inside to, to see. But another thing that the Zohar teaches is that sensitivity, year A, could also be a punishment. Someone that does mitzvot ends up with the right sensitivity. He's sensitive to Hashem. He understands how this works. Someone that does not do chas v'shalom mitzvot, what is the punishment? The punishment is the wrong sensitivity. We see it today tremendously with different conspiracy theories and different uh, people are scared of things that really that there's tremendous amount of fear of, <clears throat> excuse me, of something that's not necessarily completely real or, or realistic. And why is that? So what the Zohar explains is that is punishment on its own. But the punishment for sinning is that you you become unsensitive to the right things. And, and you become sensitive to the wrong things. As they say about a sensitive person, that you're too sensitive. What is that sensitivity that's not good? Sensitive to things that are not correct, that are not right, that are not true, or sometimes they are true, but they're very rare, etc. So the wrong year are can lead you to a very bad place. And therefore, a person wants to do mitzvot, to connect to the right sensitivity, to understand Hashem and His ways. Okay, now the Zohar explains something uh, deeper. Um, it explains that there are three levels of yira, of sensitivity. There's a tzaddik, a righteous person, benoni, uh, someone that's, that's, uh, that is challenged, is, uh, straight in the middle, that has inclinations to both sides, and the Russia, a wicked person. How does he explain it? Now, we know the famous explanation in Tanya um, about um, these uh, three uh, categories, but in the Zohar, he explains it, is that it all has to do with sensitivity. 
that a righteous person is sensitive to Hashem and Hashem is the main thing in his world, no matter what happens. When good things are happening and when bad things are happening, it doesn't matter to him. He just wants to get close to and, and have sensitivity and connection and awe of God. That is a righteous person, that's Sadiq. What is a Bainani? What is the guy in the middle that we uh, many times unfortunately connect to? Is that when something good happens, you, you, you bless Hashem and you're sensitive to Him. But when Chas Shalom, when there's challenges in life, when, when non good things happen, then you forget Hashem. Now, the Rav explains very much in the class that it doesn't mean the, the minute that something happens. When something happens, when there's pain, we scream to Hashem, we ask. But the problem is when things don't get better necessarily right away. What happens? Someone that's, that, that is, not, is not connected can lose his sensitivity of Hashem. It says that even, even a God, even a thief, when he's, when he's in trouble, he screams, God help me. But it doesn't mean that five minutes later he'll remember Hashem. So there's a difference between screaming and living um, insensitivity in your ah of Hashem. And a Benoni many times could forget Hashem in the times where things are not going well. And that is the challenge of a Benoni. But a, a, a Rasha, a wicked person, doesn't matter to him. Good things, bad things, he doesn't want to have anything, any connection. And, um, and this is something very deep that the Zohar explains is a good way of looking um, at these three categories. Um, the Rav didn't elaborate too much on it and what we learned from it, but it's a, it's a good jam to have, a good view. Um, the last thing that the Rav explains is, is in general, Malchut, the kingdom. Um, how is it supposed to be run? So the source of kingdom, Binyana Malchut, um, when you want to try to be, build um, a nation, again, um, a land, anything you want to build, first thing is, you have to be strong. You have to create rules and laws and you have to be you have to create a very strong and, and uh, violent system as we see that the most violent systems in the world are and, and good violence uh, to many times is is a country country is the only one that's allowed to carry weapons and, and decide who carries weapons and have different punishments depending on which country it is <clears throat> but the goal of these weapons and that is the goal of a kingdom is to have love, is to allow everyone to connect together in good ways. So as we said, that's, that fear is the basis that on it you're supposed to have love. Who is, who is uh, different about that? King David. King David, we know that, the, that everyone loved him so much, and that's why they made him king. His kingdom was accepted based on love, not based on a, a king soul, for example, the nation, everyone needed someone to protect them. So they chose the best guy to protect them, to create a kingdom. But with King David, everyone loved him. And that's something we're looking for when we're trying to uh, bring back um, the, the kingdom of David, um, Mashiach. We're looking for someone that everyone will love. And again, this generation, it's very easy to see that you can connect to a... Um, the Avdil, you can connect to a celebrity or someone very famous that you're saying everyone loves them and therefore he's going to be king after that there, there are definitely rules that have to be set but at the end of the day the goal of the rules is not to create great sensitivity but rather the opposite to create great connection where do we see that it went wrong like that we see it in, by, by, uh, by Solomon that King Solomon, everyone loved him. It was great, it was great times. But at the end, people became very, it became very rigid. And when his son um, uh, became king, um, they, the, the people came to him and said, we want you to be more lenient. And the, the famous thing that the uh, older people told him to do that and the younger people told him not to, and he decided to go with the younger people and say, no, 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 I'm going to be very rigid. And then um, more than half the nation disconnected from the kingdom. So we see that the inner sin that's expressed here is not connecting the nation. We are all supposed to be connected. I mean, in a small sense, you can see it even in today's uh, 
world, that everyone sees the country as a place that they're supposed to, everyone wants that the police will be something people fear, but they want to connect to the, to the place that they live, to their country based on love, based on what good it does to the world, which is, again, a small sense of, 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 uh, of, of a side of geula, of, of the end of the of redemption, the way it's supposed to be, is that everyone is supposed to love and connect to the, to the system. We'll say one last thing and then uh, we'll take some questions. That there's two types of fire. We light the fire this week. We're gonna have Lag Baomer. We're gonna have the fire that uh, we light every Lag Baomer for Rabbi Shimon. And what is that fire supposed to do? So we're gonna bring out two things. One is it's supposed to in take spark the, the light that we have for Geula that we're supposed to have a very strong connection, strong spark and strong fire for Geula, for redemption, for the right way of living. And on the other hand, supposed to burn the borders that created, uh, that Galut created. That uh, when we are in exile, when we're so far away, we create all these borders. The, the fire is supposed to burn all these borders, obviously in the, in the right way, in a good way in order to, um, no, to connect to connect us to to redemption. Okay.